The scripture lesson this morning is from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Listen now for the word of God. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to leave a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This series on the unity of the church it's a series that we chose and have been preaching through because in our culture and around us, <clears throat> there is so much uh, ripe polarization and strife going on. But here at the church in McFarland, we are blessed to be a church uh, not in conflict, but a healthy and vibrant and uh, joyful church doing the ministry together. And yet we need to attend to these matters. And so this series, this being the last in this series of sermons. Let us pray together. Oh God, we thank you for your presence among us. We pray that you would speak to us as we come to these scriptures, that you would enlighten us, that you would help us to hear the voice of your Spirit speaking through my words and this word from your scripture. And so we entrust this time into your hands, listening. In the name of Jesus, amen. A certain father had several adult children who were forever quarreling among themselves, and no words he could say seemed to help at all. So he cast about in his mind for a striking example that should make them see that discord would lead them to misfortune. One day, when the quarreling had been much more than usual, each of the children was moping in a surly manner, around the place, and he asked one of them to bring him a bundle of sticks. Then handing the bundle to each of them in turn, he told them to break the bundle of sticks. But although each one tried with all of their strength, no one could break that bundle of sticks. The father then untied the bundle and gave the sticks to each of them in turn to break one by one. And this they did very easily. My children, said the father, do you not see how certain it is that if you agree with each other and help each other, it will be impossible for your enemies to injure you? But if you are divided among yourselves, you will be no stronger than a single stick in the bundle. I'm sure you recognize this as one of Aesop's famed fables. It demonstrates the truth that is almost universally accepted, that there is greater strength with greater numbers when they are bound together in common purpose and mission. Jesus bundled up diverse disciples, to some degree even politically diverse, different in temperament and background and gifts and resources, both women and men, the twelve and many more, and formed them all into a strong cadre to launch the church when the Holy Spirit filled them with fire and voice and power on the day of Pentecost. On this day of Pentecost, we connect as inheritors and recipients of the same flame and message and strength bundled together by the powerful and unbreakable love of God made known and effective in Jesus. But as strong as the love of God is that has joined us and binds us together in loyalty to God and to each other, there are indeed forces at work in the culture and in the church that dare threaten to snip the sacred tie that binds us and diminish the strength of our wonderful life together. 
There is political and cultural polarization, vitriol, incivility, violence, and ugly, mean-spirited spinning of the facts and consequent distrust, hardness of heart, and weaponized debate. To a large degree, the ability and desire to work together, to agree, to disagree agreeably, and to just be civil and hopeful has gone haywire. If you'll indulge me a play on words, we do need some hay wire. I mean some baling wire. Up until about the 1980s, baling wire was used in baling machines to tie up those rectangular bales of hay and preserve them for their mission to feed cattle in the winter. Over time, farmers and ranchers ingeniously recycled the baling wire in every conceivable way, fixing fences, mending machines temporarily, and in a hundred other applications. As a kid raised on a farm, I participated. I gave witness to those off-the-cuff inventions. If a bolt was missing, tie the thing together with baling wire. If you needed a small screwdriver on the fly, just cut off a piece, swirl one end for a handle, take a hammer and beat the other one down, and voila, a screwdriver. Like the ubiquitous duct tape, this wire was available and effective to bind things together and fix what was broken. In the life of faith and in the church, love is the bailing wire. Love is the duct tape that covers a multitude of sins and binds us together. As Paul declares, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never gives up. Love is the bond that bundles people together in a family of faith, a church home, a community of grace. When the Scriptures speak of love and when we appeal to love, and we do often, of course, we refer not simply to warm and fuzzy feelings, not even to happy conversation over coffee and donuts. We are talking about an active love that includes a whole set of values and behaviors such as those named in this reading from Colossians 3. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive each other. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. There it is, the scriptural reference to the tie that binds, the holy bailing wire ability of love to be applied in every imagined circumstance, relationship, and dilemma in a way that wraps up the pieces into a strong and harmonious whole, like a bundle of sticks that cannot be broken. The meaning of binds everything together in perfect harmony is that love is the tie or the bond that leads to completion of the goal or completion of the mission that brings us together for the accomplishment of the intended purpose. Love is the power of the Spirit of God to create cooperative and harmonious church out of many different people. Love is the power at work within each of us so that we can think feel, and behave in ways that bond us together for the mission that the world may know the love of God in Christ. This bonding love of God is most effective 
when we are not passive. This unifying love is something that we need to work on and that we are urged to increase intentionally and urged to coax to maturity with diligence. To the church in ancient Thessalonica, Paul wrote, Indeed, you do love all the brothers and sisters, but we urge you, beloved, to do so more and more. And in the scripture from Ephesians read earlier, we hear, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What we hear in these scriptures is, love the people in the church more and more and make every effort to preserve the unity of the church. Be eager and engaged because love is not literally, of course, a piece of bailing wire or a strand of duct tape. It is made real in the ways and the means that we choose to interact with each other, trust each other, listen and talk with each other. God intends that we work at loving those who disagree and who disturb us. We are called to do this with eager, intentionality, with all speed and determination. The word behind that phrase, making every effort, means to hurry or to give it our energy and attention. Church, this is a major part of our calling. If we are to remain strong and if we are to deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ in both word and action for another century and beyond, which indeed is our calling, we also must attend with great and clear effort to the unity of the Spirit and the peacefulness of the church. This we must do in spite of forces that threaten to divide country community, and the living communion of saints. This we must do in spite of haywire politics, both outside and inside the church. We must beware of those who would wield wire cutters and try to sever the bond of love in Christ while we make every effort to grow our love even more, our love for God, our love for God who so loves the world, and our love for each other. We must avoid engaging in behavior such as distrust, accusation, suspicion, separation that avoids listening and learning, prejudgment without conversation, and other behaviors that would cause us to love less and less and cause us to make little or no effort to maintain the unity of the church. So what are the efforts to promote unity that we are called to make. From our scriptures, we have named seven overarching or big picture practices that form a compelling and doable pathway to the continued unity of the church. Today is the seventh and final in this bundle of sermons called Together That the World May Know. This is the wrap-up sermon of this bundle. To recap then, remembering that these are very brief summaries of whole sermons, the seven practices are these. One, shared worship. We worship the one God made known in Christ, and in worship we experience the bond of God's love in singing, praying, hearing the word proclaimed, baptisms, reception of new members, collecting our offerings, and more together. Two is shared mission. The world is hurting and lost and needs churches that are strong and able for the long term rather than crippled by division or diminished by separation. We are together that the world may know the redeeming love of God in Jesus. You may remember from that sermon about mission that we can imagine that God has a big t-shirt with words printed on it, work it out. And like quarreling children, we are placed inside the shirt so that we work out our differences and decide we can live and work together in harmony 
for the mission, for the mission that we share. The world deserves it. The spiritual and tangible needs of the people in the Norman area call for it, and God intends it. Three is shared humility. We learn that love is more constructive than knowledge and that we don't know what we don't know, that we are called to a humility about knowledge and about allowing a variety of convictions and practices among us so that love and unity can flourish. The fourth is shared table. The central act and reality of the crucified Christ celebrated at the table of Holy Communion, the Lord's table, makes us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world. If we walk away from the table because we think ourselves too pure for the mixed gathering, we deny the power of the gospel. Paul says in Galatians. The fifth one is shared thinking. The way we think together about God and how God works is critical. The way we think. We begin with Holy Scripture and we understand God's Word to us in dialogue with tradition and reason and experience. And like the early church making big decisions, we come together to think together, listening, learning, and discerning the truth together. The sixth one is shared healing. All of us stand in need of healing, forgiveness, and of reconciliation to God and with each other. As the church, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation and healing. Healing, love, makes unity possible. And when the church is healed and whole we can more convincingly offer healing grace to the world. And, of course, the seventh one is shared strength. We are living, breathing, baptized, sticks in a bundle, bound by the love of God, called to strengthen the bond of God's love more and more, to make every effort toward the Jesus-defined and biblically mandated value of pulling together for the long haul. When we harness all seven of these, pull them all together, God works in us and among us to deliver the gospel in word and deed. Borax is a mineral used in many detergents, cosmetics, and enamel glazes. It helps the world be clean and beautiful. You may know about 20 Mule Team Borax, a laundry detergent booster with multiple cleaning applications. And the name, of course, refers back to the late 1800s when over 20 million pounds of borax was hauled out of Death Valley, California, taken across the Mojave Desert to the nearest railroad. They used huge wagons with a 20 mule team, all yoked in a single long harness. Well, actually, there were 18 mules and two draft horses. But the wagons that carried the load weighed almost 8,000 pounds. They were designed to carry massive amounts of borax. The iron wheels were 7 feet tall at the back and 5 feet tall at the front. The team of 20 pulled those huge and sturdy wagons a grueling 165 miles at 17 miles per day and also pulling a 1,200-gallon water tank so that the mules could be watered at the dry stops between the times when they stopped at the few springs along the way. The total weight being pulled was about 36 and a half tons, over 73,000 pounds, and enduring the heat with temperatures rising as high as 125 degrees, men called mule skinners managed the mission 
to deliver the valuable cargo to its destination. And here's the thing. That team of 20, both mules and horses, could pull much more together and more efficiently than if they had had 21 wagons with one mule each or even two teams of 10 mules with multiple smaller wagons. For example, a large Belgian draft horse can pull about 8,000 pounds. But when two horses pull together, they can pull not double the amount, but 22,000 pounds. And when they train together and pull together in harmony, those two horses can pull up to 32,000 pounds, four times what one horse can pull alone. Church, we have the most valuable message of grace and means of mercy to deliver. Imagine the ability of a church, our church, any church, to not only maintain but strengthen our unity and effectiveness when we determine to love more and more so that we increase the harmony, when we decide to make every effort so that we preserve the unity, and when we dedicate ourselves without reserve to the love of God that calls us to learn to work together and pull and sink together for the mission, our mission, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Imagine what great good can, that we can do when we insist on being a vibrant and harmonious church, unhindered by division and not missing a step, changing lives that change the world. Together, we can do far more than we can do with less. We can carry out the great evangelistic commission to make disciples, baptize, and teach the way of Jesus. We can deliver on the great commandment to love neighbors and adversaries and the whole world with a love that feeds the hungry, rescues the perishing, cares for the dying, lifts up the children, brings hope to families, champions peace with justice, and both praise and works that God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We can enjoy together the great assurance that if we take the yoke of Jesus upon us and together learn from him and pull together for him, we can live with burdens lighter and find rest for our souls. We can emerge from the throes of the pandemic, dodge the dangers of division, and come back even stronger. We can underwrite a church for our children grandchildren, and for generations to come to the glory of God and for the redemption of the world. We are God's church, baptized with living water and with the fire of the Holy Spirit into one body. We are bound together by the awesome and magnanimous love of God that the world may know. May it be so. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for your spirit at work among us, your spirit that has baptized us into the one body, your church. Now set our souls afire for the mission to change the world, to redeem the world, to announce the gospel and live the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.